If you have your Bibles, uh, we're in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Once again, Genesis 3, verses 1 through 6. I've entitled the message this morning, Just Like My Dad. And of course, we couldn't have Father's Day without a couple of dad jokes. You know, the difference between a psychologist and a magician, being here in Mayo country, you'll appreciate this kind of a medical reference, I suppose, a little bit. The difference between a psychologist and a magician, a magician makes rabbits appear in hats, while a psychologist makes habits appear in rats. Habits in rats, rabbits, and, okay, there it is. So, you have, I, I went out the other day and bought another dog for our family. I bought a puppy. I happened to buy it from a blacksmith. And as soon as I brought him home, he made a bolt for the door. There it is. Wise cracks can unite families. Dad jokes can unite families, even if it's only in joint eye rolling against dad. <laughs> dad jokes at the same time even though they're not often lauded uh, for the art form that obviously they are, <laughs> there is some usefulness that when you, the family is going through tension, going through maybe even a little bit of conflict, sometimes humor, even though it may not get a lot of laughter, can help diffuse some of that tension. It can have a positive impact. It can also get inappropriate looks from your wife, like, did you really just say that? now, but I digress. We under, also understand that humor in those contexts can be not only something that is shared, whether it's wanted or not, but sometimes those traits can be passed down from one generation to the next. I have seven children, six of whom I'm blessed to have here with us today. And even watching how my children have developed and grown, I have four biological offspring and three children that have come into our family through adoption. Even just watching how my adopted sons, though we share no genetic uh, bond between us, have been able to start cracking dad jokes. <laughs> it does my heart some good here. <laughs> and we, we are able to pass down different characters. And I'll, I'm also thankful that in the whole scheme of things, they're learning more than dad jokes from being in our household, but they are learning and getting things passed down. But it also troubles my heart sometimes when I see how I have handled things perhaps improperly, where I am dealing with a situation and I'm allowing my frustration to bleed through in an inappropriate way, or where I am procrastinating and putting something off. And I watch some of those habits playing themselves out and duplicating themselves in the lives of my children. It brings me to shame. It provokes me to consider the example that I am setting because God has called us men not just to bring these children into the world, not just to slap a paycheck on the counter to make sure they can eat and wear nice clothes. The Bible tells us that we are to raise up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I am moved more and more to consider as I have fewer days left of my children. My uh, youngest one at home now has fewer years in front of him where he will be in my household than he has uh, had behind him. Uh, I am losing uh, another son next year. Uh, he's going to be a senior in high school, and another one will be leaving the fold, his sister the year after that. And we have a limited window of opportunity. We must consider the example that we are leaving from. We must take that responsibility seriously. Because while you can continue to have an influence on your children throughout their life, make no mistake, the influence changes once they leave the household. The win window of opportunity is limited. So what kind of an example are you leaving? What kind of principles are you installing in your children? 
those patterns that they learn from will they will learn from them they will duplicate them make sure you're leaving a good pattern because one of the things that we learned from the text this morning even as we have learned a few weeks ago that we inherit the consequences of adam's sin we also inherit the proclivity the tendency to commit sin not just the consequences but we are destined we are genetically wired one might say to do the thing that adam and eve did in the garden of eden to go against what god's expectations are and to follow our own desires to do things that will be self-serving again I might understand that there is something that needs to be done. I might also understand that it feels really good to stay in bed, or it feels really good to sit here in the chair and uh, waste another hour watching the television or watching my Celtics get demolished by the Dallas Mavericks the other night, which I know if Gabby Hayes were here, there he is, he's probably going to give me a hard time about. But those kind of things still can be deterrence from what we should be doing. Again, what kind of an example are we following? We are following in the example of our father Adam that we read about here again in Genesis chapter 3 as Moses describes for us to follow. Let's read these verses again once more time as we work our way through the passage and consider what our pattern is that we follow. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For the God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. This is the word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, that on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing here to the reading of his word this morning. The first thing that I want you to realize as we see the example that Adam Adam leaves, the pattern that he has set for us that we continue to duplicate as his children, is that disobeying God as he did has destructive consequences. There's an outline on the back of your bulletin and your worship guide if you would like to use that to follow along. And that's the first point that we're emphasizing here this morning. Disobeying God has destructive consequences. What are those consequences? What are the results of Adam's fall? In Adam's fall, we sinned all. We all fell in that way. We have the consequences, but we have the pattern of behavior. Some have said when they look at humanity and try to evaluate what our condition is, where our position is, what is our state, some people have drawn the conclusion that pretty much we're, we're good. We, we are well off. Uh, we don't really need to worry too much. It's just the optimist might say, if you know, just give a little food and water, a little bit of maintenance, um, we're, we're doing okay. You'll, you'll be fine. You know, don't sweat the, the small stuff and everything's the small stuff. It, that life is the way that it's supposed to be and it's pretty good. But others, trying to be more realistic, say that's a little bit too positive of a spin. You're not acknowledging the reality that there is suffering in the world. There is disease. There are shortcomings. There are Uh, struggles, there are losses, there are disappointments, there are people who let us down, because humanity is sick. We need to address these problems, perhaps with physical problems, with medication and health care, 
maybe different kinds of mental health therapies, uh, providing assistance, because humanity has issues and issues that we need help in overcoming. Those things are well and good, and, and maybe you can see how people reach those conclusions. But the Bible doesn't exactly support either one of those conclusions. What we see, the consequences for our sin that are laid out for us here, is what God warned about. In the day that you eat of it, what does he tell Adam and Eve? You will surely die. And that is how the scriptures present us time and again. They don't die immediately physically. They don't cease respiration. They don't flatline. But spiritually speaking, they are dead before God. That's spiritual death if you're using the outline to fill that in and follow our progress. What does spiritual death mean? What was God trying to warn them about when he said, the day that you disobey me, you will die. What does that spiritual death look like? Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And these are familiar words to many of you. Paul actually is quoting them from the psalmist. This is words that he's borrowing from David to make his point. This is not a unique idea with him. It's an idea that is grounded in God's revelation. But some would object to this, to say, no one is righteous, no one is good. I mean, how do you account for all the good things that we see people in the world doing. I mean, you have people who are doing things like famine relief and disaster relief, or people who demonstrate generosity who have nothing to do with Christianity, and they're doing good things. My, neighbor, my Muslim neighbor across the street came over the other day and gave me this kind of welcome package and, and, and made me feel at home, and he's a good person. And you're telling me that the Bible says he's not a good person, that, that there is none righteous, none who does good? That doesn't match up with my experience. Well, the Bible is not saying that there aren't people out there who are doing things that will benefit others and benefit society. The Bible is not saying that only Christians are capable of doing good moral things in the world today. What the Bible is saying is there is none who are righteous. There are no people who do good enough to meet up with God's standard of approval. What the Bible is telling us is that if we offend the law in one point, we are guilty of the whole thing. Again, maybe we put it this example. That I am a good driver, officer, I always, almost always, keep the speed limit or I drive maybe five miles, give or take, either way. But I'm reasonable. I never run stop signs. My tags are, are up to date. Uh, I'm wearing my seatbelt. Look at all the good things I'm doing. Well, did you know that you just ran a stop sign back there? Well, I didn't see it. Is that going to fly when he writes you the ticket and you bring that to court and say, well, judge, your honor, I know that this man caught me doing this, but here's all the other good things that I've done. He's not going to let you off if you have been held guilty unless it's for his own mercy. Because on the merits of what you have done, you are responsible to pay the consequence. He or she will be well within their rights to hold you accountable for that one transgression, even though there are many other times and many other areas where you've had compliance. It's the one transgression that you're concerned about in that specific scenario. And what God is telling us here in Scripture when he says there is none righteous, 
no, not one, is not that we are the worst possible sinners that we could ever be, or that we are constantly and always doing the most terrible things anybody could imagine. It's saying we aren't going to measure up to God's expectation. We aren't going to meet his standard, which is perfection. This is why he's trying to illustrate for us here what our need is. Going all the way back to the fall. God, really? You're going to throw them out of the garden. You're going to condemn all of humanity just for eating that one bite of the apple, which we learned last week wasn't necessarily an apple, even though Android is superior, like we learned last week. But I digress. It's not the fruit that taints us. It's the stepping over what God wants for us, what God has commanded, and instead going with our own plan B, with what we want. We see these things are good for food. They're pleasant to the eyes. They make us wise. They fulfill our desires and not God's desires. And when we do that, we are continuing in the sinful pattern that our first parents established for us. No one does good. No one understands. You say, again, that doesn't seem to make sense. There are plenty of people with great intellect and great capacity. We live in, again, a, a town that's driven by a research hospital. So we have great intellects in our congregation. We have great intellects in our community. They've been able to defeat uh, many different diseases and treat different things. And people come here all over the world to have their problems solved. What are you trying to tell me, Pastor, when the Bible says there's none who understand? And you can look past Rochester. Uh, there's, there's people, there's great minds all over the world, authors and artists and, and people who have been able to accomplish great technological accomplishments and all these different things. What, is it, what do you mean trying to say when the Bible says there's none who understand? Well, again, this is speaking in spiritual terms. We don't have the capability to understand what God is telling us here, when what is necessary for salvation. We are going to try to rationalize things in a different way. We're going to try to justify where maybe one day our, our good works will outweigh our bad works, that we can overcome these things with therapy or with medicine or with science or these different kinds of things, where God tells us and he warns us in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person, the person on his own, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly, they are foolishness, another translation says to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, you need to understand the problem from the perspective of the one who established the parameters in the first place. I saw this humorously illustrated a few days ago. Uh, when I was reading a headline from one of my favorite periodicals, the Babylon Bee. Any Babylon Bee fans out there? All right, a few of you. Uh, it says the, the, the two-year-old just can't understand uh, how his parents can be both kind and good when they won't let him play with the sharp kitchen knives. <laughs> you know, he, he knows what he wants. He knows it's something that he thinks will make him happy, and he can't understand why the parents have taken that away from him why it's going to cause him harm. With our limited understanding, sometimes we can be the same way in our relationship with God. He knows what is not only going to serve his purpose as well, but his purposes that are going to be ultimately for our benefit. And we try to deceive ourselves by saying, this is what I want. Maybe God has created us to enjoy the physical relationship within a committed bond of marriage. But the world tells us you can find satisfaction by playing the field. And that's what I want. That's what I deserve. That's what my body is telling me. I must have to find fulfillment and happiness and experience everything that I want. And God, it isn't fair that you have limited me in this way. 
The Bible tells us that's not just something that God is doing to restrict us, to hinge us in, and to, to kind of cramp our style. It's for our benefit. It's for others' benefit. The Bible does it for human good, but humanity, time and again, and this is not just a recent phenomena, has often tried to twist it. You can find happiness. You can find joy and satisfaction by pursuing what we ultimately will learn, if we do, are things that are going to bring maybe immediate gratification, but long-term heartache, long-term pain, destruction and disappointment and misery. This is important for us to understand. This is, the, well, this is exactly what God is talking about. He says no one understands. We are driven by what we want, and we often fail to anticipate what the outcome will be. Finally, no one seeks after God. This speaks of capability. This speaks of even our desires. That is not to say that nobody ever looks for the spiritual, that nobody ever on their own doesn't seek some kind of a higher power, but they don't naturally seek after the kind of God that reveals himself here in the pages of Scripture. The kind of God who says, yes, you are dead, and without me, without me providing salvation, without me making the way of reconciliation, you have no hope to come to me because of everything you are and who you are and what you want. Even in some people who tend to be maybe naturally curious, naturally religious, what you will often find is people who create a God, but a God in their own image. A God who will give them anything they want, everything they want, whenever they want, with no discretion, with no discernment. So we have the error that we see here in the United States among so many churches of people who preach a gospel of prosperity, that if you are living the way that God, if you have enough faith, God will meet every gratification, every desire that you have. You'll be driving a Cadillac, you'll be having a six-figure income, you'll have a great house, and all the stuff if you are going to be a faithful Christian. There's never any guarantee of that in Scripture. God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Yes, that is there. But also, it does promise us difficulty. It promises us trial. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer. That's the guarantee that Scripture provides, but that's the thing that people often dismiss in American evangelicalism today. This is the kind of thing that people do. They try to shape God, even in religious contexts, in the course of their own desires, in the course of what they want, where God presents it in a different way. And when he says, no one seeks after God, that's the kind of thing that it's talking about here. You are not seeking the kind of God I am. You need help to see both who I am and how I have made it possible for you to be included into my family. This is the point that Jesus makes in John 6, 44, when he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. That is, I'm giving you the revelation, the description of who I am. You are going to come to me because you are hearing about me and how I have disclosed myself to you. I am telling you, I am identifying the problem, and I am giving you the solution. Friend, that's what's important for you to understand even here today. Maybe you've come because dad coaxed you to come today because it's Father's Day, and you're doing this because dad wants you to be here, and you heard there might be some good barbecue at the end, which there is going to be. We're, we're looking forward to that too. But you know why Dad really wanted you to come today? Not just for the food, not just for the fellowship. Dad wanted you to come because he knew that Jesus is going to be lifted up here today. That He's going to remind you that he loves you, that he died for you, that you have a sin problem, that you keep following because Dad modeled that for you and his dad before him and his dad before him, all the way back to Adam. And God 
has offered the solution to that problem of condemnation for that com- 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 ongoing pattern of destructive behavior, those destructive patterns that you keep on following, God has given you the opportunity to be set free from those things because He has shown Himself to you and He calls him, yourself to Him. Death is the spirit and soul that we've seen about here. It is spiritual death. But the eventual consequence that also bleeds over into our existence is the reality of physical death. Later on in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Paul says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through the events that we just read about here in Genesis chapter 3, through their disobedience, and through one man that comes in, death through sin, consequences come in, the spiritual death makes its way down to all of us. So death spread to all men because all have sinned. We have that division. We have that separation between us and God now. Our souls and spirits die. We are given wholly over to our own desires. We are rejecting what God wants for us. That infection spiritually has made its way into our physical bodies as well. And we experience disease, sickness, suffering, and death because of the curse, because of the consequences that God places upon us for our disobedience. This is a universal situation. This is a universal problem that we all face. But God has given us relief. We have sang about it several times here this morning, that God, through the resurrection of Christ, confirms to us that Jesus' death gives us life. And we call upon you even here this morning, friend, with the reality and the identification of this problem to look at your life and make changes. That's really what it's all about here this morning that we want to emphasize to you. You have a dad, maybe in your life, who might share a few bad jokes, but also presents an inconsistent pattern in his life. As much as he might be trying to do the right thing and to show you Christ, which is the best thing that he can ever do, for you. Understand this as well. He's passed on the problem to you. The problem that you continue to repeat in your life. Not because of any intent. It's just the way it is. That's the way it is of all humanity. All have sin. All fall short. But if your dad is doing the right thing, he's going to point you to somebody else. Someone who has made the solution to the problem that we all face. And he's going to remind you that you need to trade death for life. To trade death for life. That's the next points on your outline. We are making changes and trading death for life. We aren't capable of doing it on our own. There is none righteous, no, not one. None who understands. No one seeks after God. But here's the reality as well. God has made that way, and He has given us the gift of salvation. The wages of sin is death. That's what we've talked about this morning, the consequences for who we are and for what we have done, which is the point here this morning. Not just the consequences we inherited from Adam, but the consequences for what we are and continue to do with our actions, with our rebellion, with our selfishness and greed free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ our Lord. Friend, you can look to Jesus and find salvation. You can trade this certain death that we have inherited and that we have earned for the life that Jesus Christ brings. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever, anyone, who believes in him will not perish. They will not die. At least in the way that God tells Adam it will happen. He is going to renew this. He is going to take away the consequences and put them on his son. And you will have eternal life. 
because of your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You will realize, even if you, those of you who are Christians, and if you've made that decision, placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that as we mature, as we begin to realize the depths of our sinfulness, the closer we get to Jesus, the more we will sense the reality of our need for Jesus. What we're not trying to tell you this morning, if you're here, is you need to get better. You need to do good for God. And if you can stop doing this old bad stuff and start doing more good stuff, God will accept you. Don't distort what we're trying to explain to you this morning. As the closer even that Christians who have made that decision to believe will understand that I am a sinner, and the more that I realize how perfect and how righteous Jesus is, the more I expose my shortcomings, my failures, my inconsistencies with who Jesus is. Jesus always does what is perfect, does what is right. He is the standard, but I don't always sacrifice for my family the way I should. I can use my children sometimes because they're able to do something I don't really want to do, and I can just sit there. I forget I said that, kids. <laughs> but it's true. It's in our hearts. This is what we will do sometimes. We do things, Paul says, or the author of Hebrews says, our fathers do it for their pleasure, but God always does it for our profit, for our benefit, because he's a kind, a good father. But we see these things exposed and realize that there's inconsistencies, there are failures, there are places I need to grow and change. Friend, if you've never made that decision, please don't be intimidated by your sinfulness, because for the true and honest Christian, all of us are always going to realize there's still more I need to do. There's still more changes I need to make so that I can look more like Jesus and less like my sinful self. But it starts with the reality of an outfit change. We must change our clothes. God wants to clothe us, not in our own sinfulness, not in our own depravity and all the reminders of who we are and all the bad stuff, he wants to take that and cover it with the righteous acts of Jesus Christ, with his perfection. That's what it means sometimes when we talk about justification. God looks at us, and he, you know, he understands everything that you are. He understands everything that you've ever done. And you know what he says? He says I'm going to take that dirty outfit off, and that's going to be what Jesus wears. He's going to die. He's going to bear the consequences for everything you are and everything you have done. And instead, here, take this. And he puts you in a new, bright, white, shining outfit of perfection. And he looks at you. He doesn't see anything that you've done. He sees instead the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it is applied to you. And that's what gets you in. Because you are depending on what he has done and you are counting on the fact that God is not going to hold against you what you have done. And in the end, friend, that's the only thing any of us can ever count on. If one day, as sometimes this, the, the illustration goes, if you were to approach God and he says, why should I let you into my heaven? The answer should never be because I was a good person. I went to church every Sunday I was nice to my neighbors. I was generous. I was kind. You know, any more than you would list to the officer when he says, do you know how fast you were going? And you tell him all the other things, the good things you've done. It's not going to get you off. What you need to remember is that I am innocent because Jesus paid the price for me. We sang earlier in the service. Full the pardon he has offered. Great the welcome that I receive. We can now approach God not as a judge. We can approach Him as our Father, ready to welcome us in, ready to forgive. Change your clothes. 
This is what Isaiah says. I will greatly rejoice, Isaiah 61.10, in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, as a bride adorns herself with jewels. The appeal is not what we are or what we have done. It is the garment that He has clothed us in. We remind you, friend, here on this day, that what you need is not a reformation, a change in behavior. What you need is a new father. You need what God has provided. And you need to accept that free gift of salvation. Because when we do, as the Apostle Paul says, God says, I will welcome you. I will be a father to you. And you you will be my sons and daughters. That's the relationship God wants us to have with Him. And He's made it possible because of His Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for giving us this hope, this peace that can be ours through the gift that You have provided to us through Your Son. When we are in Jesus, we have life. That life is the gift that you have given to us. And so, Lord, we pray if there is one here who doesn't have that certainty, who finds himself lost, who finds herself dead, as your word describes to us here, help them find life, help them find peace, and help them to receive it because Jesus offers it to them freely. He says, believe in me and be saved. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.